Hi, my name is Lucas Patagimus and today is September 14th and I'm here interviewing Ahmad Altrash, who is the Executive Director of Palestine Wildlife International and a very important conservationist. So without further ado, tell us more about yourself. Uh, I was uh, born in 1958. Uh, in uh, a small town of Palestine in Bethlehem area where Jesus was born uh, 10th of September 1958 and uh, my hobby was uh, helping my mom in the field as uh, we, we are planting some crops and vegetables uh, we raised in a a uh, poor uh, family and I was helping here to plant it and to sell it to our neighbors and uh, since my childhood uh, 12, 3 year, 13 years old I went to agriculture school and then uh, to my uh, higher school and I got a diploma in agriculture Oh, okay. Uh, this is my uh, basically uh, my start connecting to my nature back home in Palestine and uh, I joined uh, the Boy Scout. Boy Scout uh, taught us in uh, how uh, to have our country as a clean country, recycle, reuse, uh, reduce. Plus, I've been uh, traveling with them as uh, uh, natural walking trails, and I led that later on at the Boy Scout group. And uh, after my graduation in my, from my institute, Agriculture Institute, I uh, start to teach at Bethlehem University is located in Bethlehem also in Palestine oh, okay. as a biologist and I was assistant uh, uh, the professors in ecology geology uh, of Palestine plus uh, I was arranging for the stu students uh, the field trips to many different areas in Palestine and uh, I start my work at the university in 1979. I left the university in 1992. Now, during that uh, time, I studied uh, biology also in uh, England in 1982. And within my biology course, it was photography. Oh, okay. Now, uh, love nature. Uh, natural walking trails and photography. Oh, okay. And so, all three in one. Got it. So how did birds come into this picture? Now, with the picture, with nature, I start with uh, first of all in my life and uh, classifying the flora. Oh, okay. So flora, it's in the ground. We have around 2,700 back home. And I was in, start interested in 1984 in flora. Uh, but uh, later on, uh, I of course, I, sta I uh, published a book about the flora of Palestine in 1992. Now, after 1992, I were uh, following my uh, people in my generation. They were hunters. Oh, okay. Of birds. Got it. And because a conservation background in my mind and in my heart, and I have to protect my nature, I start to to stop them. Oh, and okay. And then I turn from a flora to ornithologist. And I became in 2010 in Brazil a global ornithologist. Got it. So it all starts in the 1980s when they're still hunting for birds in Palestine yes. and regions around. Yes. Um, not at all regulated by the government or 
No, Just because, you know, uh, the hunting there, it is by manual, not by shooting by uh, weapons or vessels or etc. Just a manual, uh, like uh, a rubber, oh. a rubber, but even a rubber uh, with very limited work on that, I don't like. I like to keep everything as nature. Right, of course. Yeah, and... Uh, I wrote so far around 15 books and booklets uh, in nature conservation and especially birds, breeding birds in Palestine. And in 2005, uh, a film by the name of Birds of Palestine, which I was a producer of this film, was the honor in an in international champion in Uchik. Uh, and uh, it was awarded by the ministry, the minister of environment in Cheek as number one out of 100. Nice. And, and it, it is in the uh, YouTube. You can uh, look at it, watch it tonight. Cool. So it's called The Birds of Palestine? Yes. Okay. Make sure to check that out. Yes. Very cool. And so tell me more about. Um, Palestine Wildlife International. Wildlife Society. Wildlife Society, okay. Yes. Um, what exactly does this organization do? It is similar of Audubon Society in nature conservation. I have trained here in 1996 by QLF, Quebec Labrador Foundation, which is located in Ebiswich in Boston, New England. And I learned one word. Uh, before I established my organization, uh, they are working in conservation education. I am working there in conservation education. I'm following up uh, my work in nature conservation for flora and fauna, starting from data collecting, uh, our collection uh, for the flora and fauna. Uh, through the mobile and the smartphone. Uh, yes, something maybe So new. advanced, wow, <laughs> okay. I will uh, teach you now. After uh, a few minutes, I will teach you the uh, OPS map, actually, they call it. And uh, uh, I learned uh, the conservation, uh, starting from data collection up to uh, doing some of the action plans for what we call it uh, according to the uh, uh, Bird Life International IBAs, Important Biodiversity Areas. I did a study for five IBAs in Palestine out of 13, oh, okay. which is also uh, as international program belong to Bird Life. So uh, from data collection up to uh, action plan for the site. We call it species, habitat, and sites. Plus, now we have a project uh, protecting uh, global uh, threatened species, which is in Europe and in Africa, not in the United States. They call it lesser kestrel. Uh, smaller than the American kestrel, but the same family. And uh, we are, uh, this is about nature conservation. We have empowering people, uh, environmental sustainability, sustainable. And uh, for example, we do uh, biogas. I don't know if you heard about it, biogas using the animal manure. Oh, how interesting. I, you know, I, I might have heard of the concept before, but I don't know anything about it, and I don't think it's quite, you know, used often here in the United no. States. But that is very interesting. So how do yeah, you Yeah, but take the, that? Leader, the leader in 2010, he's American professor, and he came to Palestine to teach me through the American consulate in Jerusalem. Interesting. So an American comes in and comes Total. up with this idea, yes. and then you guys are one of the first to implement that kind of technology. We attracted. He attracted us, and we attract the idea.
Nice. You know, because our uh, Bedouin, uh, similar of what you call it, indigenous people, they are living in the wild. And there is a lot of, of uh, go, live, livestock, uh, goats and sheep, and they don't use the manure. Right. Yeah, I went to them and we talked to them about if we will be able to use it for themselves. They were shocked, the same as you start to ask you uh, right. yourself. <laughs> and uh, then uh, I attracted them uh, to make it easier life for them. And they uh, agreed, but they opened their eyes on me if I will succeed or not. Now we have around 165 digester system working back home, having daily uh, hot water, uh, cooking food in biogas, and it costs you nothing. Wow, so and just fueled by the manure, manure of... Wow. Yes. Isn't that crazy? That is very crazy. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit crazy, yeah. But, you know, a, a nomadic society, the Benedins just go on from, you know, living a kind of a way of life for thousands and thousands of years, and all of a sudden in the 21st century, using manure to yeah, power things. It's easy way for them, need this small, small efforts daily, uh, to bring only the manure inside the water tank, and that's it. Oh, okay. And the guy, biogas will come to to the lady to the kitchen. Easy come, easy go. Right. No complicated issues. And also, we train a facilitators, a young generation from the university, who's located among their families. So. Oh, okay. I don't have an employee to go from a distant to other distant, from district to another district. The people, the family people, they can manage and they can maintenance the system all year round. Nice. This is kind of our uh, sustainable uh, work for us. Right. Plus, of course, we as we are seeing here, uh, the uh, solar uh, panels. We are advising our people in uh, the countryside to use the solar panels. Even my office, which is two floors, have uh, solar panels working in that. Now we have also grey water system. We are you reuse using the grey the water the grey water. Mm -hmm for irrigation or for reuse it for the biogas. Oh, okay. You see, the drop will be in a circle and all the time the same amount of water. You don't need to push from the pump or from the uh, water system more and more water because we are seeing that the possibility of the three R's, reuse, reduce, repair, and uh, recycle, we are there. We are teaching the, uh, training the ladies, the home uh, wives, uh, the youngest generation in OPSMAP, in uh, collecting data. Also, uh, we have a small project helping animal, helping people. We are trying to help the donkeys to be a strong donkeys because they are there uh, doing uh, the, uh, instead of the vehicles or the official transportation like here, we are uh, getting uh, a small help from Donkey Sanctuary in UK and World for Society for the uh, Protection of Animals, uh, some fund, and we are trying to help uh, the animals there because they are a good supporter to the farmers in the field. Right. And so, 
Uh, you had mentioned the use of grey water, as you called it, um, in the cycle through many different things. Um, so, I, so I understand there has been a water issue in the whole entire region. Sure. Uh, can you tell us more about it? Yes, it is a kind of political, you know. Palestine is still occupied by Israeli government and 85-86 percentage of the water resources done that groundwater controlled by the Israelis. Oh, okay. And uh, Palestinians, they are v having very small access to uh, their own resources in water. Now, this is, uh, it makes a little bit hard for them in the summertime. Summertime, uh, the temperature uh, like uh, Arizona, like Phoenix. Oh, okay. You can so very imagine, warm. <laughs> very warm. You yeah. can ima imagine uh, Phoenix or uh, Tucson on June or July, the temperature will be very high without water. Oh, okay. This is the big challenge for us there. Got it. And so if we can use uh, the grey water or reuse the water, that will be helpful at least for the people who is in the countryside away from the cities or the towns. Oh, okay. But it's a real conflict there. Right. And the summer was one of the warmest in the region. I heard so, record temperatures and yes. so it even exacerbated the problem. Yeah, of course. Of course. The temperature and we have a similar of Arizona like Jer Jericho and the Rift Valley. It will be up. Uh, unbelievable temperature uh, in the warm area there. Like 40 Celsius and higher or so? 40. Or? Uh, it is around 50 to 55. Around 50 to 55 Celsius. Degrees. In limited water. Okay. Without water. Sounds like a very big can problem you, for can, sure. Can you imagine? Uh, no, I can't imagine no. 50 Celsius. I, I, I have a hard time imagining 40 Celsius because 35 is as hot as it gets here and that's pretty yeah. bad and we have plenty of water with Lake Erie yeah. being a few miles yeah. away. But 50 and no water makes one think on how to use it best. Yes. So another question I have, um, you, you mentioned you know the constant conflict with the groundwater but the, the whole entire region has had seen its fair share of conflict in the past half a century. Um, in, in your work, have you seen you know various conflicts like this impact migratory birds? I mean, perhaps you know yeah. in the wars in the '60s and '70s in the Levant region. Uh, as for birds, you know, a little bit. Uh, we have to. F to think uh, as a, a, re, a realistic thinking. Right. Now, with the avian flu, for example, when the birds will come with the avian flu viruses, they will not ask this gentleman if he is a Jewish or a Christian or a Muslim. Right. It will come to anyone. Certainly. Yeah, and this is the big challenge to all of the people in our region. It's not easy, and as you know, it's a conflict. Certainly. How do you, you want to pass over the conflict with even if you flu? You will not be able. You have to face the problem as a regional. This is the biggest challenge. It's not only the avian flu. It's many, many different diseases. The viruses doesn't know boundaries. Right. Yeah, nature knows no boundaries. Environmental pollution knows no boundaries. If the uh, pollution will start in Tel Aviv, the one who is living in Jerusalem or in Bethlehem or in Amman, the wind will bring all the pollution to them. That means there is no checkpoints, there is no boundaries. All the people will be affecting by the pollution. Sorry. Pollution, nature, environment, uh, even flus, viruses. This is 
knows no boundaries 100 percent for that reason a little bit as the region countries jordan palestine and israel even in egypt even in lebanon they have to think about how to solve the environmental issues starting from the virus to the pollution right through also in the middle the water issue water issue also it's connected to the human being in this region if it is polluted that means everyone will be sick or ill certainly mm -hmm. and so have you seen any perhaps chances of cooperation despite so many conflicts and so many divides sure, to work on sure, these common sure. problems the avian flu, flu yes the avian flu uh, the environmental problems you know, there is many, many different uh, issues. It should be, uh, and they are in a high level in the CEOs. They are working under the table to solve all this uh, conflict. Oh, well, that's a good thing. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, many big issues there. With the avian flu, uh, every single organization were there very aware about the avian flu because it's everywhere no boundaries certainly it's a public health risk and yes sure and the economy right yeah. economy health environment you know human health uh, wildlife health also certainly and can you tell me more about um, additional smaller challenges that perhaps um, you guys as an organization have uh, helped resolve or mitigate. Um, I, I think your website it's mentioned national it, level or regional level. Um, well, on a local level. Local um, level. Local level around Bethlehem, for example. Um, various smaller issues mm. such as maybe desertification happening in certain areas and changing yeah. land use practices to combat that? Uh, our office, it's located in Bethlehem, but our work, it is a national, West Bank, Gaza. Oh, okay, so it just yeah. covers that whole entire region. Yes, whole uh, region. Now, <clears throat> what's the biggest issue? For example, in, uh, of course, uh, we are uh, thinking all the time, advising the schools, uh, first of all, to establish the eco club, the environmental club. Oh, okay. At, among the schools, we have around 500 schools belong to our network. Nice. And the second issue uh, that uh, if we will go uh, to Jericho, there is very intensive agriculture because it's located in the Rift Valley. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, 1,200 feet below the sea level and there is uh, a lot of, of using pesticides oh I see chemical pesticides which is you know polluted the fruits the soil the water the air the health and we thought that if we can advise our farmers to think about the biological control you know what is does mean biological control well to a certain extent but please explain it for us more okay. so now uh, we have because very intensive uh, work uh, in agriculture in the Rift Valley uh, there is a lot of, of rodents and because of the rodents, they are eating the crops and the vegetables. Right. The farmers will go to use the chemical pesticides a lot in high density. Now, we thought that if we can advise the farmers to use a barn owl or, or kestrel boxes, All right. that means we will attract these birds, come and breed, come and have chicks and come have family. Every single owl eating a day 10 rodents. If you have a family of seven, 
that means a day 70 rodents. If you have 10 boxes incubated by the owls or the kestrels, right. with a seven uh, seven uh, members of the family, that means you have 700 uh, owl. That right. means 700 by 10, that means 7,000 rodents every day eating from all the field, which is there is no need for the farmer to use the uh, chemical pesticide. Right. No pollution for the water, no uh, pollution to the vegetables of the crops. By the end of the day, no uh, pollution for the human. So we admit to teach the farmers which is in our culture a little bit hard to uh, explain to the old people, the seniors, right. that this is an owl because we know owl it's a bad luck for us. Oh no, so that's part of the challenge saying yeah. it's really not that yeah. much of a bad luck. It's, yeah. it's going to be good luck. You're not going to have any rodents yeah. and yeah. there's just going yeah. to be more yeah. elves. Yeah. And you everything know, else is going to no benefit. No cost, no, no pollution. You know, this is our wildlife society uh, organization think about how to do a sustainable work. Right. How to be so friendly to our nature and our people. This is the main point. Together for na people and nature. This is our slogan. Our mission of, of Palestine Wildlife Society to raise up the, uh, the awareness and to be very close to the nature. Nature does not need you, but you need nature. Yeah. You see? I, I think that I agree with that slogan. Yeah. You know, having the capacity to, well, destroy most of nature many times over we have a responsibility not to yes that we're destroying ourselves and do we really have the right to destroy it even yeah. if we can so yeah this is uh, some of uh, how we did uh, delivered our message to our people conservation education by the end of the way you are implementing something never ever happened in Palestine. Second, you start to have a good number of people who are supporting you even by sending their kids to our activity or they are participating with our activity. It's a long, long, long journey. Right. It is a long journey. It's not easy. It's not one year or ten years. This so far it's seventeen years, but I am there. I hope that God will give us the life, and we are doing something to our society. Wonderful. So we have a start to the journey, and hopefully there will be more and more people who will take on the baton and continue it forward. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. you like it? Yes, I do. That is very cool what you do in terms of just all of the different projects. I mean, I've never heard about the manure being used. <laughs> and and I heard about the Benedictine people, and I, I knew that they're nomadic, that they're very tied to their traditions, and just this introduction of something that's so new, so avant-garde, into, well, yeah. into their society, and they're accepting it, yeah, of most course. importantly. You need I mean, it's a wonderful start. A great effort to let them accept it. Right, I, I can only imagine. Yes, it's not easy. You know, with the um, chief uh, and responsibility of every single community with a Bedouin, it is taking a lot of time to explain to him. And if by the end of the explanation he said to you no, that's me no. You will Got not it. be able to get inside the community. But if he said yes, he will be working with you and his family, his daughters, 
his woman, his uh, all of the community will work with you 100%. So, ha so I understand that you managed to take you know some of those communities and completely well change them by sure. allowing them to a access to this resource, but. Uh, how successful, what are the chances of success approaching a vendor community? I imagine there's a lot of, you know, different things that have to be taken care of and, well, convincing someone to um, achieve to allow this within his community, right? You know, building every core and um, working with an open-minded individual who sees the benefit for their community in that. I think uh, the uh, people who is in charge of the community, first of all, they are not educated in a school or in a university. Right. They are by experience, they will be as a, ch a chief or a sheikh, what we call it. Oh, okay. And of course, uh, with the some of them, because they have a lot of, of problems, they can be able to uh, solve any issue. They will face it among their community and among the cooperation or, uh, you know, uh, the conflict with other communities in the same region of them. Oh, okay. And now, uh, myself personally, with uh, uh, hot spots, issues I will mm -hmm. go by myself oh, okay I have uh, the capability uh, to uh, look at you mm -hmm. and to go with your mind and your heart whatever mm -hmm. you will start with me I have a great experience how to deal with you immediately oh, okay even you know sometime like hyena you know hyena yes yes I been once, I put my hand, this hand, to his mouth. And you cannot imagine if the hyena, uh, but just, yes. No hand? <laughs> no hand. <laughs> right. Within seconds. I can show you the photos. I put my hand inside his mouth. So no one uh, can do it. And I have, uh, thanks God, I have uh, my great spirit for dealing with animals, with birds, with people in high level. Got it. Yes. You know, so, so you can see them, you know, understand what kind of person yes. or animal you're dealing with, whether they're a nice animal or a not so nice animal, and and see, see. Well, what will make them do something that you want them yes, to do. Yes, for sure, for sure. Nice. Yes.